somewhere once that when um, when uh, certain kinds of like deciduous pl <coughs> deciduous plants like like roses that if they're you know bitten down a bit like chewed down by a that by a um, by a herbivore that the, the the second or third growth they put up um, it will the plant will change the chemical composition of the uh, of of the of the plant matter and it may, it may be more oxalic acid or something like that have you ever come across an argument like that yes i i think there's something to that um uh, when when plants are attacked for instance by various insects uh they actually send out chemical and now people even think perhaps auditory signals what? to plants of their own species, and they will begin to uh, manufacture toxins that repel the insect. So there is a lot that we do not know. Right. You know, and you, we used to laugh at people that said stuff like that. It sounds fanciful. But, you know, they have found out, for instance, in, in especially in older forests, uh, mother trees will actually feed their, the seedlings underneath them through the mycorrhizal network, which right. is to me unbelievable because how do they know which seedlings to feed? And they keep them alive in case they die and open up to the sunlight. And then they'll have the nutritional ability to replace the mother tree. And so it's, it's sort of like taking care of your children. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to anthropomorphize it too much, but that sort of stuff is turning out to be true. I mean, they have, they've used like mildly radioactive dyes so they can trace the sugars okay. and they see the sugars through the, going through the root systems into the microbial, uh, into the mycorrhizal fungi and then going to uh, the seedling. So that, I mean, that's pretty incredible stuff. You know, the only way you're going to really have a good, uh, mycorrhizal fungi community in a, in a soil is to sort of leave that soil alone and not till it up too much and not not cultivate it too much and kind of have a no-till type situation. There's arguments that's not scalable to agriculture so not a lot of people are going to research that unless they're just curious people. Um, so you know I, I don't think it's 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 researched enough and it would be great to see like the, the example you just gave where they put a little bit of isotope in with to see where everything's going. But it would be, I mean, I've got some friends at Acadia University and I'm like, do you guys ever research this? Do you ever research that? Do you ever? Because, I mean, one thing I've noticed in my garden is that I don't, I don't really, I mean, sh sure, we, we have rain here and it's, it's, um, it's wetter than a lot of places in, in North America. So, you know, if I say I didn't water my garden from, for July or August or September, I basically stop watering it in July, sometimes even June every year. Once the seedlings, you know, are a certain height and I put the mulch down, I stop watering the garden. So then people will say, well, yeah, but you get a lot of rain, you're in Nova Scotia. Um, but anyone that lives in Nova Scotia, I mean, pe people that have a garden where the soil isn't covered, they have to water their garden all summer long. I don't have to do it. Um, and to some extent, the, the mulch is keeping, you know, the soil from drying out, as you suggested earlier. Um, but I also think it's very possible that um, to a certain extent, the um, capacity of, of those plants to plug into a mycorrhizal fungi network and maybe get water that way. But I don't know. It's just, it, it seems amazing to me. I'll go out, everything's growing. I'll put my hand in the ground. The ground feels kind of dry, but the plants are still getting what they need. And is it, you know, because the mycorrhizal fungi network is just extending so far beyond the roots. Mm. And, you know, I don't know if they're just getting nutrients or if they're getting water or what they're getting out of that. But uh, what I do know is that I don't have to water my garden all summer long. <laughs> you well, know? I, I, I just went out into my garden, which is mulched with straw. Right. And when I, it's about a four, four inch thick, maybe mulch. Yeah. And when I pull that aside, I can just, literally show, pull my push my hands into it right and, down the wrist. it and chances are there's a worm in it yep. and it has that perfect nutty texture yeah. uh it's moist things are happening there if you have an open garden situation that you're hoeing all the time 
you created a desert. Yeah, and yeah. So you have basically reduced the microbial and and mycorrhizal networks to well very very low levels whereas with the mulch essentially what you're creating is the duff on a forest floor yes and so you and if you go into a forest and you dig underneath that leaf mulch you'll find even in dry fairly dry weather there's still moisture there yeah there's some yeah but what the amazing thing is is even if it's extremely dry for a long period the trees generally don't die yeah. And that's because, and you, you can go in it and the soil is dry, but they are, they are harvesting that, those microbial networks or mycorrhizal networks are harvesting water from way down and way out. So they have increased the amount of moisture available to these trees. Yeah. The same thing can happen in a mulch garden in, in whether you're growing roses or, or cabbage or whatever. I mean, yes, we, we do have some slug problems with certain types of materials. So this year, for instance, uh, my broccoli, I'm actually going to use a compost mulch. So I'm gonna pull it aside, plant my little seedlings and just mulch them with compost. Right. So, uh, and that, even though it's moist, the, the slugs will not live in that kind of situation. They'll live underneath the straw mulch because it's really airy and and yet moist and you know they've got protection from birds and so forth so uh there's there's generalizations and then there are always exceptions to the rule you really have to kind of do your own research as as you grow yeah. you know find out what works and what doesn't yes well and it's it's funny because the my my whole beginning as a, a no-till mulch gardener started with roses in a sense because i, I had a on my old property, I had a rose garden. And uh, in that neighborhood, they had a place where you could go get free mulch, right? They just had this, these big piles of it. A place you could take your leaves and you could take this. And they had a, what's that called? Um, tub grinder, right? Yeah. Um, right. And so it would only be open. I mean, the thing would open at noon on a Saturday. It was like the worst time of the day to be. And it's, the flies there were insane. So, and you're, 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 you're getting this stuff at like the height of black fly season at high noon when they're the worst. Um, why they, why wouldn't they open at like 7 a.m., you know, when, when gardeners are out and they want to be out in the cool. Um, anyway, so you get this stuff, everybody called black gold. It was just, just, you know, just everything you can imagine, like the leaves and whatever was in that tub grinder, right? Everything under the sun. And we'd put this on our roses. So my, my garden, you know, I'd turn it over every year and it was, black and it was you know the way I was taught to garden and my rose um, garden was mulched with about four inches of this you know mulch and I, I, I got that mulch because it looked nice and it made, made you know made it all one color and it seemed to keep the weeds down but every year when I would get uh, you know tomato transplants I'd always have a couple extra that didn't really fit in the garden and I'd jam them in that rose garden <laughs> next to the roses just to stick them somewhere and those tomatoes would always outgrow the mm. tomatoes in my vegetable garden. And the tomatoes in the rose garden uh, didn't get as many hours a day of sun as the one in the vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> right? But they had the benefit of that mulch and what it was doing for the soil. And so when I, the first time I heard an argument about keeping gardens mulch, very similar to what you, were, you said on the show, very first time that was laid out to me, it resonated with me because I was like, that's why those damn tomatoes <laughs> in my rose garden tomatoes I always outgrew my vegetable garden tomatoes. Same variety, same everything, less sun. And I wouldn't put any work into the rose garden soil. Like the, mm -hmm. the soil where my vegetable garden, I'd be double digging. And every, every year I come up with some new trick, you know, putting this thing in this, this amendment. And, and the rose one, I just like add a you know a few inches of that dark stuff to make it look nice every year. And little did I know that was just the easiest way to maintain soil quality. So, yep. Yeah.